Bochot Abaot, and thank you so much for logging in to another weekly session of our Torah classes. It is with great sadness, tremendous, tremendous sadness, that today's Shi'ur has to be dedicated to a tremendous, tremendous person in Klal Yisrael. I don't even know where we could begin. Um, other than to say the words Nafla Ateret Roshenu, the glory of Am Yisrael has fallen. The great Gaon, the Tzaddik, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, passed away this Erev Shabbat Kodesh, and with great sadness we were informed that the great Gadol Ado is no longer with us. He is passed on from this world. I'm not sure if there are enough words to even discuss the greatness of this man or if there were enough tears that were even shed on behalf of his ptira. I think the best way to honor this great man's memory is by telling you a little bit, just giving you a little bit of information about his life and then to do what he loved most, to learn with you Torah. And Be'ezat Hashem, I hope that whatever you guys pick up from this shi'ul, the inspiration that you draw should be, I don't even know if the right words to say in Elui Neshama for him because I'm sure he's in the highest place possible, but at least to give him the, the tools and the weapons needed to be the best the best Melitz Yosher for all Am Yisrael. So let me give you just a little bit of history about this man and then we'll begin the actual Shi'ur. Harav Gaon Vachashuv Harav Shemariahu Yosef Chaim Ben Harav Gaon Vachashuv Harav Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky he was born in 1928 in the city of Pinsk, which is now called Belarus. His father was the great and revered stipler Gaon, Zecher Tzadik Vekadosh Livracha. When Rav Chaim Kanievsky was only six years old, his entire family moved to Eretz Yisrael and they came by boat. As the boat neared the shores of Eretz Yisrael, he put the sefer that he was learning on the side and he told his father, Abba, Tati, I want to wait to continue learning until we arrive because then I can truly celebrate my learning in Eretz Yisrael, in the Holy Land. And that gave young Chaim not only an appreciation for the preciousness of Torah study, but also a tremendous love for the land. And since that day, Harav Chaim Kanievsky never left Israel, he never left Eretz Yisrael, and he was a lifetime advocate for Aliyah, encouraging every Jew to move to Israel sooner than later. Rav Chaim was a child prodigy. He had a photographic memory which he used solely for the study of Torah. Let me give an example of what kind of little boy he was. When he was learning in the yeshiva in Bnei Brak, you know how he spent his recess breaks how do most kids spend their recess? With a ball, playing ball, but not Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Not Rav Chaim Kanievsky. You know what he was doing instead of playing ball? He was sitting in the corner of the, the yard, counting the number of times in his head that the various Rabbanim are mentioned in the Talmud. Could you believe this? But wait, by the time he was bar mitzvah, 
He finished learning the entire Talmud Bavli, the entire Shas, which is something that many men don't manage to do in their entire lifetime. And he did it by the time that he was 13 years old. I want to tell you something else that many people don't advertise about this revered Rav. In 1948, during the Israeli War of Independence, five Arab armies attacked Eretz Israel, and all the Jews were in a state of emergency. At that time, believe it or not, Rav Chaim Kanievsky was only 20 years old, learning in Petah Tikva, in the city of Petah Tikva. During the attack, an army truck pulled up to the yeshiva and took all the yeshiva students to the site where the artillery, all the weapons were near Tel Aviv over there. And Rav Chaim Kanievsky was ordered by the army to climb a large hill because over there there was a, a large storage of weapons and he was given a stick and two stones to fend off any potential attacker if you could believe it. So you know what Rav Chaim did? He took the stick and the two stones together with a gemara underneath his arm and he climbed the hill and while he was on that hill keeping watch that means he was a soldier in the army he managed to learn Torah the entire time until the attack was over incredible what many people don't know is that actually Rav Chaim was a private citizen which means that he wasn't the leading Rav of any shul of any yeshiva, he didn't hold any official rabbinic position, even though he was offered many positions of stature. His father, the great tzaddik, the stipler Gaon, Shalom, always told him, your contribution is to sit and learn Torah, that's it, period. And that's what he did. He committed himself with great fervor and love to sit and learn Torah day and night and never did he wave from that position, ladies. Rav Chaim Kanievsky was a baki in every kind of Torah subject, whether it was Hamisha uh, Chum Torah, Navi, Ktuvim, the Talmud, Midrashim, Kabbalah, Halacha, and every single week he would sequester himself in a room with hundreds of letters that people wrote to him asking him all kinds of questions and with great patience and love he responded to every single one of those letters this is a man who like the great tzaddik and gaon of our generation Rav Ovadia Yosef Alava Shalom touched the lives of every single Jew of every sect from every corner of the world and every religious affiliation. And you were able to see that at today's funeral, at today's Levaya. Everybody was standing there together, Be'achdut, no matter the kippah worn on your head or the kind of hat, no matter the rabbanim that you held of, no matter the kind of business that you ran or the yeshiva that you were learning in, no matter who you were, no matter who you were, every Jew was standing there side by side, crying together, mourning together. This is the greatness of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Alava Shalom. And that was something that he spoke about just days before his passing, how important it is not only to learn Torah, but even more important than the learning of Torah is to be together, to be Ba'achdut, to love our fellow Jews and to be at peace with one another. That was really what was most important on his mind. So before we begin the shiur in his memory, 
I just want to say a few more words about this great Rav. When I found out about the Ptira, it was Friday night. I had just finished lighting candles and I went downstairs to my neighbor because I was invited for Shabbat. And I walked in and everybody was sitting around the table. Everyone was solemn. Nobody had even gone to shul yet. And they broke the news to me. And I was trying to hold back the tears. It was Friday night and I was trying to hold back the tears until my neighbor said, it's, it's okay to cry on a Friday night for this reason. When you lose a gadol ador, when the sun sets on Am Yisrael, it's okay to cry even on the Shabbat. And so we, he, he were, here we were sitting around the table, we were all crying for this, the loss of, of this great man in Am Yisrael. And my neighbor, her husband, told me an incredible story that happened with him and Rav Chaim Kanievsky that I must share. He said that he was zeichet to meet him twice. The first time, he went by himself when he was a newly married man. And when he sat next to Rav Chaim Kanievsky to ask for a bracha, he was wearing a jacket, as is, as is our custom, the men wear jackets on top of their shirts. And the Rav noticed that underneath the jacket, he did not have long sleeves, because you can tell, you know, when the jacket kind of hangs, you can tell from the inside if the person's wearing a, a shirt or not. So Rav Chaim Kanievsky turns to my neighbor and he says to him in Hebrew, Do you need me to loan you some money? So my neighbor was taken aback and he says, uh, No, Kvadarav. Why does the Rav say this? And the Rav answered, well, maybe you need some money to buy fabric to add to your shavulim, to your sleeves. And then he said the words, shavulim, shavulim. He expressed how important it was even for a man to be modest and never to walk around with short sleeves, even in the summer. A few years later, my neighbor went back to Rav Chaim Kanievsky with his three-year-old son on the day of his upsharon, of the traditional cutting of the hair. And the little boy was wearing short sleeves. He's a little boy, right? Rav Chaim took one look at my neighbor, and then he took a look at the child. And he said to the father, I told you, Sharvulim, Sharvulim. If you want your children to be Yarei Shamaim, to be God fearing Jews, if you want them to have the chance to be true tzaddikim, true righteous individuals, make sure they only wear long sleeves. Wow, could you believe this? And since then, my neighbor made sure that his son dresses according to the standards of what Rav Chaim Kanievsky said would merit a true tzidkut for this child. And this child, getting to know this child, is sitting next to him at the table. I want to tell you he's a truly special child, Bli Ainara. And I, I want to give you an example how special this kid is. He's six years old. Now, a six-year-old, what does he notice? He noticed the things that concern him, his games, his toys, the things he wants. And at some point during the meal, they took away the fish plates. And uh, my friend took away my plate, which included my fork and knife, because you know we don't use the same fork and knife for the fish that we do for the meat. And I see this little boy looking around the table, and everyone was served the, the second part of the meal. So everybody got new plates and new cutlery. And I, I got a fork, but I did not get a knife. And I see this little kid looking around the table, and he says to me, you didn't get a knife. 
So I, I look around and said, yeah, you're right, I didn't get a knife. I said, okay, it's okay, I'll make do. And he says, no. And he took his knife and he gave me his knife. That's midot tovot. Later on during the meal, we were all going around saying something nice about what Hashem did for us that week. And everyone was going around the table and I stayed quiet. After everybody said what they did, chutz from me, I didn't say anything. This little boy pipes up and he says, one second. Everybody spoke. Chutz from her. You see what I'm talking about? He was so aware and so attentive to who? Not to himself. Towards others. And, and I believe very much, and I attribute that to the bracha of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Alav Shalom. Ladies, Rav Chaim passed away on this Shushan Purim. That was the day when Haman a descendant of Amalek fought to annihilate the Jewish people. Amalek is the antithesis of Torah. And our best weapon that we have against our enemies is the learning of Torah, which all of you women are so devoted to. I commend you for your spiritual diligence and devotion. And in the schut and the memory of the tzaddik, let's increase not only the learning that we do, but let's try and apply the lessons that we learn so that the passing of this great, holy, and revered Rav will not be in vain. And as the sun sets upon our nation, I pray that it should rise again with the coming of Mashiach. Amen. Amen. This week's parasha is parashat Shmini. Tonight, ladies, we're going to learn an amazing chidush in memory of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Alav Shalom. And this chidush was brought down by the great Gaon of Vilna, Alav Shalom. And it's not just an eye-opener, but it relates to the current and final exile that we find ourselves in the final exile of Rome, Rome, referred to as Galut Edom. The Gemara of Yoma informs us that there is a very distinct difference between the era of Bait Rishon, of the first temple, and Bait Shani, and the era of the second temple. What was the difference between these two eras in Jewish history? Well, when it came time for the first Bet HaMikdash to be destroyed, the Gemara asks, What was the reason that God destroyed the first Bet HaMikdash? It was due to the three major cardinal sins. Avodah Zara, idolatry, Shfichut Damim, murder, and Gilui Arayot, acts of immorality. The first Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because Am Yisrael engaged in the three cardinal sins of which one has to surrender his life rather than to transgress them. But when the second Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, the Gemara offers a completely different cause for its destruction. The Gemara states, Aval Mikdash Shani, but the second Bet Mikdash, Shehayu Oskim Ba Torah U Mitzvot. Even though people were engaged in Torah learning, observing the Torah laws, and even doing acts of kindness, the second Bet Mikdash was destroyed. Why? Says the Gemara, Mipne Shehaytabo Sinat Chinam. It's because there was baseless hatred among Jews. They simply didn't get along. There was an inner hatred and resentment that they felt for their fellow Jews. Now ladies, when we discuss baseless hatred, sinat chinam, what does that mean? How do you hate somebody, chinam, without a reason? There must be a reason for the resentment and dislike that a person feels. It comes from somewhere. 
Hatred comes from some deep-rooted place. And that's precisely what the sin was. Meaning, if you would have spoken to those Jews who hated and arrived at the core of why they were behaving in such a hateful manner, you come to the realization that it was ultimately for a reason that truly had no merit at the end of the day. Chachamim say they hated for reasons that the Torah doesn't permit you to hate. What does that mean? Well, the Torah allows you to hate somebody if he engages in certain averot that the Torah HaKadosha classifies as sins that you would need to display a hatred in order to demonstrate to that person how abhorrent those sins are. So you're allowed to hate, but only what the Torah tells you you need to hate. But Chachamim tell us that in a generation with so much Torah learning and observance of the mitzvot, they hated for reasons that HaKadosh Baruch Hu deemed as unfounded, baseless. They hated for reasons that Hashem didn't deem fit or correct. And they were punished severely, dafka, because of their extensive Torah learning. Their learning should have guided them to a place that would help them to distinguish between the proper hate and unjustifiable hate. The sina was unfounded in Hashem's eyes. Even though a person thought he had a perfectly good reason for his feelings and his behavior, in reality, his hatred had no merit according to Torah law because his feelings were biased, because his feelings were only seen from his own humanistic perspective, from his selfish side, from jealousy, and therefore a person's harsh reactions were considered baseless according to what Hashem deemed as a fitting hatred. The hatred they felt was a soul according to the Torah. So the difference between the destruction of the first and second Bet HaMikdash was that the first Bet HaMikdash was destroyed due to the three cardinal sins and the second Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam, because of baseless hatred. You know what we learned from this ladies? That Sinat Chinam is Shakul it's equivalent to all three cardinal sins because it took three major sins of this of this kind avodah zara giloy arayot and shfichut damim to destroy the bet hamikdash that means the same equal force of evil is required in order to bring down another bet hamikdash and yet the gemara tells us that the sin that brought down the second Bet HaMikdash was Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred. Therefore, Chachamim deduce from this that Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred, is equal to all three cardinal sins put together. If Sinat Chinam carries the same weight as the three Averot Chamorot, the three most grievous sins, that's already a lesson, a big musr shmuz all on its own, because it forces us to contemplate the question of why are we still here, trapped in this exile that's lasted for 2,000 years now. Obviously, if we're still here, there's still a rectification that needs to be made. There's something we're not doing right. And the answer is, we're still ensnared in this galut, because of that awful sin of sinat chinam that's equal to the most grievous sins. But then the Gemara continues with quite a fascinating idea that I heard Rabbi Daniel Gladstein Shalita point out. Chachamim in the Gemara tells us, tell us, 
Yes, it's true. Am Yisrael engaged in the worst averot during Bayit Rishon and they reached a level of Rashaim. They were deemed evildoers. But, says the Gemara, Talu bitchonam ba'akadosh baruch hu. Even though they were the biggest sinners, they maintained their faith and trust in Hashem. They were engaged in the worst possible sins, in idolatry, in, in murder, in, 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 in uh, immorality, averot that they're required to die for rather than commit, but they still had bitachon in Hashem. They still had trust and faith in Hashem. That's amazing if you think about it. But during the times of the second Bet HaMikdash, although they were Torah observant and engaged in so much learning of Torah, their level of emunah and bitachon was weakened. Now that's odd. We just learned that during the times of the first Bet Mikdash, the Jewish people engaged in the three cardinal sins and they were referred to as Rishayim. They worshipped idols. They engaged in immorality. They murdered people for crying out loud. And yet the Gemara says, yes, they did all that. But you should know that they were botech ba'ashem. What do you mean by the word botech ba'ashem? What was that? They had great faith and trust in God? What in heaven's name is the Gemara saying over here? If they were such rishayim, who engaged in these three major averot, what kind of bitachon did they really have? And why is the Gemara even discussing their faith and trust in God? Who cares? I mean, what kind of bitachon do you really possess if you're engaged in the three worst sins possible? What's going on over here? The Gaon of Vilna offers us not only a fascinating chidush about this subject, but it's actually connected to this week's parasha. Not only that, but the next piece of Gemara, which is a Gemara that not too many people talk about, ladies, tells us that Rabbi Yochanan Alav Shalom said, Rishonim, the people of the first Bet Mikdash, Shenit Gale Avonam, their sins were done openly. People saw them engaging in those sins. They didn't hide their sins. They didn't engage in these sins in a discreet and private way so that nobody should know what they're doing. Therefore, says the Gemara, because their averot were done openly, nidgale kitzam, the end of their exile was made known to them. Meaning, because the averot were made known to everybody, the end of their galut was also made known to them. They knew when their exile was coming to an end. They were told the exile was only going to last 70 years. So they knew. It was out in the open. But during the time of the second Bet HaMikdash, the Gemara says, the acharonim shelonit gale avonam. They were engaged in a sin that was internal inside of them and hidden within them. They engaged in sinat chinam, which means you didn't know what your fellow Jew really thought or felt about you because he kept it hidden inside of him. On the outside, he professed to be your best friend. He professed to love you. But on the inside, he resented you. Asks the Gaon of Vilna. You know what the difference is between an oyev, an enemy, and a sone, and somebody who hates you? Chaz v'shalom. Well, shouldn't those two words mean the same thing? Because if he's your enemy, surely he must be your sone. He must hate you. He's definitely not your friend if he's your enemy. And the Gaon of Vilna says, no, don't get confused. There's a huge difference between Oivecha and Sonecha, between your enemy and the one who hates you. 
What's the difference? Oivecha is an enemy who openly displays, whether in words or through his behavior, that he's against you, that he hates you. He's an oyev. He's an open enemy. You know exactly where he stands. There's no doubt in your mind that he's not your friend. But Sonecha, the one who hates you, he's a much more dangerous person. Because his resentment, his sina, is on the inside. On the outside, he claims to be a friend. He tells you and others how much he loves you, how much he cares about you. But no one on the outside knows what he's truly harboring inside of him, what he's really thinking and feeling about you. That's the person that when you turn around for a moment, can stick a knife in your back. The Gaon of Vilna says, that's worse than the, than the Oyev, because you never saw him coming. You never realized he could do such a thing because you believed him when he claimed to be your friend. The Sone is worse than the Oyev because you never know what he's really thinking and feeling about you. His resentment and his hatred is hidden inside of him. He's never showing his true cards. With the Sone, you don't know what he has against you. And that makes him a much more dangerous enemy than the Oyev who clearly lets you know where he stands. So Sinat Chinam is a hatred that you harbor deep inside of you. And the Jews harbored hatred concerning their fellow neighbors and they didn't show it. They kept their resentment and their hatred hidden. They called it love when it was really hate. So says Rabbi Yochanan, during the times of the first Bet HaMikdash, although the Jews sinned in the worst ways possible, they weren't a bunch of fakers. They sinned openly. Everybody knew about the Averot that they were engaged in. They didn't hide their spiritual status. And because of that, the Kets, the end of their exile, was exposed to them, mida keneged mida, measure for measure. The end of the galut was made known to them in the same way that their sins were not concealed. Their sins were out in the open. And so the kets, the end of the galut, was also out in the open. They knew when their exile would finally come to an end. But during the times of the second Bet HaMikdash, the Averot that the Jews engaged in at that time were hidden. The Sina was an inner one that they didn't divulge. Therefore the Ketz, the end of their Galut, remained hidden from them. And we're part of that Galut. And we've been feeling the result of not knowing when this exile is going to come to an end. And Rabbi Yochanan adds, that although the sins of the Jews during the time of the first Bet HaMikdash were so awful, would you believe that the Gemara says they were still on a much higher level than the people who lived during the times of the second Bet HaMikdash? Could you believe that? During the times of the second Bet HaMikdash, they were learning Torah, and the majority of the people were keeping the mitzvot, they were involved in kindnesses and milut chasadim, but they were still not as great as the people who lived during the first Bet Mikdash, who engaged in the three cardinal sins of Avodah Zarah, Shfichut Damim, and Gilui Arayot. Wow! Listen to Rabbi Yochanan's terminology. Listen to what he says. The tziporen of the rashonim, the nails, you know what a nail is, right? This is your nail. The nails of the people who lived during the era of the first Bet Mikdash were better than the stomachs 
of the people who lived during the times of the second Bet Mikdash. What does that mean? The tziponaim, the nails, they're a part of the body that people see on the outside. We see your nails. The stomach, however, is an organ that you can't see. It's hidden on the inside of your body. So the sins that the people during the first Bet HaMikdash engaged in, they were outwardly sins. They were sins that took place on the outside. And those sins were still not as terrible as the sins that the people during the second Bet HaMikdash did that took place on the inside. Like the sin of Sinat Chinam, where they harbored hatred against another Jew inside of them, and on the outside they pretended to love him. That's what Rabbi Yochanan states in the Gemara. Ladies, if that's the case, I want to know what's so bad about Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred, that it's equal to the Averot of Avodah Zara, Shfichut Damim, and Gilu Yarayot. I mean, I know it's terrible to hate a fellow Jew, but why does the Torah equate baseless hatred with such grievous sins? There's a famous Gemara of Kiddushin where we're told that the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, is so evil that even his creator, even Hashem, refers to him as Ra. As wicked. Well, what's so evil? What's so bad about the Yetzirah? You see, Hashem brought us into this world and gave us free will. Bechira Chofshit. Hashem wanted us to earn our rewards and He wished to repay us in the best possible way. He didn't want us to receive a handout. Rather, he wanted us to get a reward that displays our own personal successes and merits. So how does that work? Well, it's very simple. I'm given the right to choose between right and wrong. And then I overcome that challenge. I choose to step away from that which is incorrect and evil in the eyes of God. I choose good over wickedness. I choose compassion over mercilessness. I decide to follow a path of righteousness versus a path of sinfulness. And therefore, Hashem wants to reward me for something that's well deserved. I've earned the reward. I've chosen well. The most perfect reward you could bestow upon a person is a reward that he actually earned and merited. But in order to be challenged and tested, there's got to be some mechanism required, something outside or inside myself that has to pull me in the opposite direction, right? Someone's going to have to do the dirty job of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination. There has to be a force pulling you in the opposite direction of good as much as there's a force pulling you towards that good because that's where your free will to choose between good and evil and between right and wrong, boom, is going to kick in and activate itself. So your free will enables you to make the right decisions so that you'll receive your due reward that you rightfully earned. That was the takhlit. That was the purpose of creating man in this world. Says the Ramchal al Shalom. If that's the case, so what do we want from the Yetzirah? He was created to tempt us to choose the opposing side of good. The Yetzirah's job is to persuade us to sin. His role is to coax you to do what you shouldn't be doing. That was part of the purpose of creating a human being. 
We needed someone to do the job of the bad guy. That's the Yetzirah, that's the evil, evil inclination. Therefore, Hashem created the role of the tempter. Now, nobody wants the job of the Yetzirah at the end of the day. But somebody's got to agree to be the Yetzirah. So the evil inclination was appointed by God to be active in his role as the seductor, as the tempter. So why is he referred to as Ra? Why is he called evil? It's just the opposite. The Yetzirah is very good at his job. I'm even going to tell you a story that highlights this point. When the famed Rav Yitzchak Hutner, Allah Shalom, was a young man learning in the Slobatka Yeshiva, one time he was in the hallway, and the, uh, and the great altar of Slobatka, Allah Shalom, walked out, and he saw him pacing back and forth and going over in his mind a piece of Gemara that they had just learned. So the altar of Slobatka asked him, Rabbi Yitzchak, what are you doing out here in the hallway? You should go back to the Bet Midrash. So Rav Hutner said, I'm, I'm going over the Gemara with my chavut over here, with my study partner. So the altar says, well, who's your chavuta? Because I don't see anybody standing next to you. And Rav Hutner said, my chavuta, my study partner, is my yetzer hara, my evil inclination. I'm going over the piece of Gemara with him, with my yetzer hara. So the altar said, well, if that's true, why don't you at least uh, be a chavuta, be a study partner with your yetzer hara tov. You should, you should be a study partner with your, your good inclination. And Rav Hutner answered the following. There are two reasons why I choose to have the Yetzer Hara as my Chevrota. First of all, my Yetzer Hara is much smarter than my Yetzer Atov. And I want, a, I want a very sharp study partner. And secondly, I could always count on my Yetzer Hara to show up. How true is that, ladies? The Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, always shows up. He'll always be there doing his job. So what do we want from him? He's simply doing the job that he was instructed to do. And he does his job with great wisdom and with a great deal of patience. So why does Hashem refer to him as Ra, as evil? Says the Gemara of Kiddushin, Kashe Yetzerara, the Yetzerara is so bad. Afilu Yotzro Keraora, that even his creator called him Ra, called him evil. And I still want to know, well, what do we want from this guy? What do we want from him? He's just doing the job he was designated to do. He's our sparring partner. That without him, we'd never grow. We never elevate ourselves in matters of spirituality. So why is he called Ra? Not only that, but besides the fact that God calls him Ra, evil, the Gemara of Sukkah tells us that Rabbi Yehuda, alav shalom, said, now when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to take the Yetzer Ra, v'shochato, he's going to slaughter him. The Yetzirah, who we know is also the Satan, is going to be slaughtered in front of the righteous and in front of the wicked. Wow. Why is he going to be slaughtered? Slaughter? You're going to slaughter? Give him a medal for doing the best job and fulfilling the purpose for which he was created to do. But here the Gemara is telling us he's going to be shechted. Shechted? Give him an award. Or at least let him retire in peace. Let him go back to where he came from to live out the rest of his life in eternal bliss. But no. Instead we're told he's going to be slaughtered. Why? In Sefer Bereshit, the Pasuk states, Vayevater Yaakov levado. And Yaakov was left alone. Vayavek ish imo. 
And a man wrestled with him, Ad alot hashachar, until the break of dawn. And all the mefarshim, all the commentaries want to know, who is this Ish? Who is this man who wrestled with Yaakov Avinu alav shalom all night long? And the Midrash Rabbah Bereshit explains that this Ish, this man was the Sar of Esav, the archangel of Esav. The Sar of Esav is none other than the Satan himself, who we know is the Yetzirah. It's the same body of evil. Yaakov fought with Esav's angel all night long. Now I have to ask you a question, ladies. You're not going to be able to answer this out loud, but think about it in your minds. When you think about that episode of Yaakov wrestling with Asav's archangel, who you know is the Satan and also the Yetzer Hara, how do you picture this archangel, this Sarah Vesav? What do you think his archangel looks like? Think about that. Well, the Gemara of Chulin, in the name of Rav Shmuel Bar Nachman, Shalom says, the Sar Vesav, you know what he looks like? He looks like Oved Kochavim Nidmelo. He looks like a Gentile who worships the stars. Meaning, as soon as you see him, you assume he's not a Jew, he's a Gentile. Well, that's very interesting because the Gemara also tells us that Rav Shmuel Bar Acha Alav Shalom said in the name of Rav Bar Ola that no, 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 doesn't look like that. Ketalmid Chacham Nidmelo. The Yetzer appears to be, he looks like a learned Torah scholar. He comes off as a Talmid Chacham. You look at him and you think he's a big rabbi. Oh, that's interesting. Look at the opposing views in the Gemara. One rabbi tells us the Sarah of Esav, which is the Satan, the Yetzirah, looks like a Gentile, like a Goy. The other rabbi says, no, 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 no. The Satan, the Yetzirah, looks like a Talmid Chacham, like a Torah scholar with a long white beard and a huge kippah on his head and a long jalabiya. These are two opposing sides, two opposite extremes, Gentile and Talmudic scholar. And what does it mean exactly that the Yetzirah looks like a Talmud Chacham, like a Talmudic scholar? To answer these questions, we're going to analyze our parasha, where there's a powerful message for every Jew living in today's Galut. Ladies, this week's parasha discusses the various animals that are kosher for consumption and those that are not kosher. The parasha mentions four particular animals that are not kosher. Three are in one category. The fourth one is in a category all by itself. The first three are the gamal, the camel, the Shafan, the rabbit, and the Arnevet, the Hyrax. The Hyrax looks like an overgrown guinea pig. These three animals chew their cud, but they don't have split hooves. According to Torah law, in order for an animal to be kosher for consumption, it has to have two defining simanim, two signs. The animal must have split hooves and it must chew its cud. Chewing its cud, by the way, means that the animal regurgitates its food and then it kind of redigests it a few times. If an animal doesn't have these two simanim, it's not considered kosher. Now the gamal, the shafan, and the arnevet, they all chew their cud, but none of them have split hooves. Therefore, they're not kosher. But there's another animal, a fourth example mentioned in this parasha, that's also rendered not kosher, 
but is exactly the opposite of the other three animals. The other three, we said, chew their cud, but they don't have split hooves. The fourth animal does have split hooves, but doesn't chew its cud. The fourth animal is the chazir, the pig. The pig is an animal that's not kosher for consumption. So although the pig seems as if he may have a kosher sign because he's got the split hooves, but because he doesn't chew his cud, he, he's off the kosher menu. So again, we have four animals that are not kosher because they're missing one of the two signs that would qualify them as kosher. Says the Midrash These four non-kosher animals, they actually correspond to the four galuyot, the four exiles that Am Yisrael is destined to suffer through prior to Mashiach's coming. So let's go through the animals and the exiles that they correspond to. The first is the gamal, the camel. The camel corresponds to Galut Bavel, the Babylonian exile. The second animal is the shafan, the rabbit. The rabbit corresponds to Galut Madai, Parasu Madai, which is the Persian exile. The third animal is the arnevet, the hyrax which corresponds to Galut Yavan, the Syrian Greek exile. And the fourth animal, the Chazir, the pig, corresponds to this fourth and final exile that we find ourselves in called Galut Edom, the Roman exile. So we have four non-kosher animals corresponding to four different exiles. And the Gaon of Vilna says something fascinating. He says, during the era of the first Bet Migdash, the first three nations that exiled us, they were actually involved in the history of the destruction of the Bet Migdash. How so? Well, during that time, the destruction of the first temple began with who? With Babel with Babylonia. After that, we found ourselves in Madai, Parasu Madai. And once Madai was overthrown, then the exile of Yavan began, and it continued through the era of the second Bet Migdash. But the point is that during the era of Bait Rishon, of the first temple, we were actually ensnared in three out of the four exiles, Babel, Madai and Yavan. Now since these three nations are represented by the three non-kosher animals that appear in this week's parasha, I want to know the connection between these three nations and the three animals that represent those nations and what that has to do with the first Bet Migdash. What's the connection there? And the Gaon of Vilna answers the following. These three animals have a characteristic that takes place on the inside. How? Well, they chew their cud. That's something that takes place on the inside of the body. Which means on the inside, they have a kosher sign. But on the outside, their hooves are not split. So on the outside, they're not kosher. And that's exactly what the Gemara told us concerning the people who lived during the era of the first Bet Migdash. Those people were involved in the three cardinal sins that they did on the outside, openly, while on the inside they still possessed tremendous bitachon, tremendous faith and trust in God. So the reason why the Jewish people were subjugated to 
and had to go through the exiles of these three particular nations of Babel, Madai, and Yavan was because those three nations are represented by the three animals whose definitive sign is what? Very simple. On the outside, they show their trefut. They show their unkosher status because you could see that they don't have split hooves. You could see it. But on the inside, they chew their kud, which is a kosher sign, but not a sign that's visible. It's not something you could see. So because the Jewish people's sins were done openly while hidden inside them was their belief and trust in God, they were subjugated to the three nations that are compared to the three animals that on the outside they look tarif, they look unkosher, you see that they're not kosher, but on the inside they have a sign of kashot, they possess a kosher sign. Says the Gemara. This was not the case during the era of the second Bet HaMikdash. The people during that time looked kosher on the outside. On the surface they appeared good. They were learning Torah, observing the laws, engaging in good deeds. On the outside they appeared to be in a very good spiritual place. But their problem was the inside. They were engaged in sinat chinam. They hated their fellow Jews on the inside. They harbored hatred against each other on the inside. And that's why those Jews of the second temple era were subjugated to the chazir, to the pig, to malchut edom, to the Roman exile. Because on the outside, the pig looks kosher. You see on him the sign of kashut because he's got the split hooves. So he looks kosher v'yosher. But on the inside, he's tarif. He's completely non-kosher because he doesn't chew his cud. The inside is where his problem lies. So because the people were flawed on the inside, they were handed over to the nation of Edom, who's represented by the non-kosher animal, who appears kosher on the outside, but's really non-kosher on the inside. That's the Gaon of Vilna's chidush. He writes that what happened to Am Yisrael was literally a midah keneged midah, measure for measure for the way in which they behaved. That's why they were taken into captivity by the various nations represented by the non-kosher animals whose traits and actions B'nai Yisrael mirrored. So now that we have that information, we could proceed to the next level. During the era of the first Bet Migdash, when the Yetzirah, when the evil inclination came after the people, what did he do? He enticed them to engage in the three cardinal sins, to do those abominable, abominable sins out in the open, on the outside for all to see. So the Yetzirah approached the people like which three animals? Like the Gamal, the Shafan, and the Arnevet, where on the outside they show their trefut, they show their unkosher status. So the Yetzirah used the traits of these animals to ensnare the Jewish people. Just like those animals show a treif sign on the outside, so too the evil inclination wanted us to engage in sins outwardly even though on the inside we were like those animals in the sense that on the inside we were kosher. We had this inner faith and trust in God. The Yetzirah's game plan during the first temple era was to trap the people into doing sins on the outside openly which represented these three non-kosher animals, the camel, the rabbit, and the hyrax. But during the era of the second temple, the Yetzirah changed his tactic. 
He didn't attack us through the traits of the first three non-kosher animals. He attacked us through the trait of the fourth animal, the chazir, the pig. The Yetzirah changed his strategy. This time, he wanted us to be non-kosher on the inside and kosher on the outside. He said, I want you to show everybody your kosher sign, like the pig, like the chazir. Show everybody your split hooves and be like the chazir who lifts his paws and he says, oh, look at me, look at me, I'm kosher, I'm kosher, I got the split hooves. I want you to be like the chazir and show everybody how kosher you are and tell people, I'm a good person, I have a good heart, I'm kosher v'yosher, I'm a good Jew. See? See? The Yetzer wanted us to show how kosher we are on the outside, knowing full well that the non-kosher sign of the chazir is found on the inside. He wanted to create a scenario where to the public, to our friends, to our neighbors, even to family, we present ourselves as good and righteous Jews, like from an Erlicha people who are learning Torah, observing the mitzvot, engaging in all kinds of wonderful kindnesses, acts of milut chasadim. He wanted us to look like tzaddikim on the outside when we were like the chazir on the inside. We were not kosher. We were just the opposite. We were tarif because we were harboring hatred, pretending to care for our fellow brothers, professing to love them when on the inside we were thinking the worst things. We were malesina, we were full of hatred. Says the Gaon. Notice how the Yetzirah switched his tactic. That was the secret behind the self-delusion that the Yetzer Hara infused into the Jewish people during Bait Shani, during the temple era of the second Beit HaMikdash. That self-delusion was far worse than the sins of the people during the first Beit HaMikdash. During Bait Rishon, the people showed you their sins quite openly. You knew who your neighbor was. You knew what sins he was involved in. Your neighbor admitted to his sins. He admitted to his averot. He said out loud, yes, yes, I sadly engaged in this avera. Yes, I engaged in this terrible ta'ava. They were open about their sins. But on the inside, they had such bitachon and Hashem. That was their way of saying, we know we're engaged in the most terrible acts. We're displaying a very clear picture to you of our sins. We know that we have a lot to work on and that there's something severely wrong with how we're behaving. We know that we're doing, we're doing terrible things out in the open. But on the inside, we're still holding on. We still have such faith and trust in God. But during Bait Shani, the Yetzirah switched gears. He said, on the outside, let everybody see how great you are. I want you to show that you're the best Jew on the block. But on the inside, you're going to be full of hidden hatred. On the inside, you're going to be taref because nobody's going to see your siman of trefut, just like the chazir. And you're going to be so self-deluded that you're actually going to think you're this amazing tzaddik and you're going to show your tzidkut on the outside, your neighbors are going to think that they have the biggest tzaddik living next door to them. 
But no one will know who you are on the inside, how taref you really are, the thoughts that go through your head and the feelings that reside in your heart against your fellow brother. No one is going to know what goes on in the chambers, inner chambers of your heart. You're going to be one person on the outside and another person on the inside. Says the Gaon of Vilna. When a person fails and he does Averot openly, it's very clear to him and to those around him exactly where he's holding. And that person knows exactly where he's holding and what he needs to, to do in order to correct his behavior. But the person who thinks that he's the best and holiest Jew out there, that he's so good and so kind and so benevolent, while on the inside he has such a terrible demeanor where he hates his fellow Jew and speaks Lashon Hara about him in the worst way possible, in even a hidden way, Avak Lashon Hara. When you talk to that person, uh, he seems like the biggest tzaddik. People love him because of what seems to be his kindnesses and his righteousness. But, says the Gaon of Vilna, on the inside, sadly, he has the siman of a chazir. If you knew what that person is capable of thinking, and doing on the inside, the things he doesn't share with you, the things he'll never tell you, you'd no longer deem him a tzaddik. The Ramchal Alav Shalom in, in Sefer Mesilat Yisharim writes that that person, such a person, is kashemi kulam. He's the most difficult of all. You know why? You know why he's the most difficult of all? Because he himself is buying into his own uh, righteousness. He himself is convinced that he's a great person, that he does only good all the time to everyone, and that he's the most religious and God-fearing person. He thinks that when he's going to go up to Shamaim, he's going to have treasure loads of, of rewards waiting for him. Meanwhile, says the Amchal, this person is worse than the one who engaged in the three major sins known to us. This person is so disillusioned that he doesn't even realize what and how much he needs to change inside himself. He doesn't even know what really needs to be corrected because not only is he disillusioned concerning who he is, but because he displays a false tzitkut, Everybody around, th around him thinks he's a righteous person. So instead of clobbering him over the head with Musa, what do, what, what do his neighbors tell him? Such a good person. You have such a good heart. You're always doing so much good. You're such a tzaddik. Says the Mahan tzaddik. This person is the worst of them all. Because his inside is not at all what he presents on the outside. That's something the Ben Yishchai Lava Shalom wrote in his Sefer Ben Yehoyada. He says, that's why God refers to the Yetzahara as Ra. That's why the Yetzahara is called evil. You know why he's called evil? Because Hashem says to the Yetzahara, is this what I hired you for? I hired you to present sins to the people. I hired you to tempt the people to do averot so that they have a choice in front of them between what's right and what's wrong. I wanted them to have free will to choose between tov and ra. That's where you come in. You're the ra part. You're representing the evil. But I never hired you to cause the people to do mitzvot. I hired you to tempt them to do sins, to do averot. I hired you to be the gamal, the shafan, and the arnevet. I hired, you, I hired you to be the one who openly shows the non-kosher side of things. To show them the trefut, 
the evil and then let them decide if they want to go in that direction, if they want to choose that path of destruction. But I didn't hire you to be the chazir, to be the, the pig. You took your purpose to a place you were never given permission to visit. That's the nature of evil. That's why Afilu Yotzro Kira Ora. That's why the Creator Himself called the Yetzer Ra. Because the Yetzer Ra took his game and he turned it inside out. Like the Chazir. He turned everything upside down for the Jews. He made them appear like the Chazir, where on the outside they would say, Oh, look at me, look at me. I'm a kosher Jew. Look at my split hooves. Look at my livush. Look at how I dress. Look at my yichos. Look at the good deeds that I perform. Look at the tzedakah that I distribute. The Yetzirah turned us, if you think about it, into our own marketing companies. It were our own marketing companies. I do this, I do that. I'm, a, I'm such a good person. I'd never do this, I'd never do that. Meanwhile, on the inside, there's a huge side of us that's ra, like the chazir. And that's the side of us that nobody knows about. That's the side of us that's hidden. And even that side, we're never gonna, gonna own up to it. So Hashem is so upset with the Yetzirah because the Yetzirah created this disillusionment inside of us. And sadly, we fell for it. So Borei Olam, the creator of the whole world, tells this Yetzirah, you are Ra. I never hired you for that. I hired you to present Averot, sins, before the people. I didn't hire you to masquerade the evil with the wrappings of good deeds and mitzvot. That's something I didn't hire you to do. Says the Baal Shem Tov, Alav Shalom. That's the reason why the Yetzirah is going to be slaughtered when Mashiach comes. Why is he going to be slaughtered? Listen to this. The Gemara of Shabbat states, Shochet Mishumai. I'm going to present you with a question. If you shechted, if you slaughtered an animal on Shabbat, which avera, which transgression were you involved in? What did you do wrong by shechting an animal on Shabbat? According to Rav, alav shalom, he says it's mishum tzoveya, because when you slaughter the animal, the, the blood comes pouring out, and then it colors everything that it comes in contact with. So by slaughtering the animal, you colored on Shabbat. That's the Isur of Melachav Shechita on Shabbat. However, Shmuel Alav Shalom says no, no. It's Mishum Netilat Neshama. The transgression, the Averah, is that by shechting the animal, you removed the life force out of its body. That's not allowed on Shabbat. Well, is there really a dispute over here? If you slaughter an animal, you, you are coloring everything that the blood comes in contact with. So why does Shmuel say, Af mishum natilat neshama? Yeah, you're coloring, but the main thing is that you're removing the life force from the animal. Can it be both? Can it be both? So listen to this amazing dispute. Why aren't you allowed to slaughter an animal on Shabbat? What's the melacha? What are we transgressing if we do that? One rabbi says, you're coloring. The other rabbi says, you're not coloring. You're removing the life force from the animal. Says the Tosafot. What is this Gemara talking about? Who's slaughtering on Shabbat anyway? Who's slaughtering on Shabbat? And the Gemara answers, the one who's doing the shechting, the slaughtering, and not just on Shabbat, isn't the standard designated slaughterer. It's not a typical shochet. That's not the one we're referring to here. 
it's referring to hashochet de alma. It's referring to the slaughterer of the entire world. Asks the Baal Shem, what does it mean, the slaughterer of the entire world? And he writes, the shochet de alma, the slaughterer of the world, is the malach amavet, the angel of death, who we know is also the satan, and he's also the yetzerara, our evil inclination. They're all the same body of evil. So, shochet, shochato mishu mai, you know why we're going to slaughter the Yetzer Arad, that Shochet, when Mashiach comes? You know why Hashem is going to make that one of his first missions when Mashiach comes? Because Rav Amar Mishum Tzoveya, he's going to be slaughtered because he colored everything. It's because nothing he presented to us was the way it was supposed to be. He tainted everything. He was supposed to present us with averot, with sins, not mitzvot. He was supposed to present the traits of the gamal, the shafan, and the arnevet. He was supposed to display the sins openly so we could see them and then choose well. Nobody hired him to be the chazir. So because he went ahead and instead of doing what he was supposed to do, he was tzovea, he colored everything. Because he made us appear on the outside what we really were not on the inside, where he made us paint the picture of ourselves as good and holy on the outside, but on the inside we were taref. Because of that he's going to be slaughtered in return. And then the Baal Shem Tov says, and that idea also works well with what Shmuel says, that it's removing the life force from the animal. How do we see that? Because he says, the Malach Mavet, the angel of death, the Yetzer Ara, the Satan, which we know, they're all the same being, who we also know was the Sar of Esav, the arch angel of Esav. We said it's all one and the same. The way the Satan is able to draw the life force out of you is specifically by coloring everything. How does he take away your neshama from you? How does he bring you chaz v'shalom to mita, to your ultimate demise? How does he present your bad side to you? Al tzoveya. The fact that he taints everything. The fact that you become blemished inside yourself. That's what creates the ultimate demise. That leads to the netila of the neshama, of the removal of the life force. Therefore, mida keneged mida. When Mashiach comes, we're going to slaughter the Yetzer because he's guilty of being tzoveya, and ultimately leading people to their netilat neshama. So let's go back to Bayit Rishon. During that era, people were openly engaged in serious sins, but everyone knew exactly where they stood. Everybody around them knew, and they knew where they stood. They were aware of their shortcomings. But on the inside, they still held on to their trust in Hashem. These people showed you the way it was truthfully and honestly. There were no games. They didn't trick anybody. They didn't hide anything. They showed who they really were on the outside, like the Gamal, the Shafan, and the Arnevet. But during the era of Bait Shani, of Galut Edom that we're still in, that was the quality of the Chazir. That was the Yetzer Ara's new tactic, which was much more despicable, underhanded, and crooked. And for that reason, the Yetzer Ara is going to be slaughtered. 
because he helped us to be tzvu'im, to be tainted. On the outside, sadly, we show ourselves to be one person, when on the inside, we're another person. On the outside, we make people think that we're very honorable, good, and righteous people, when in reality, we're deluded. We believe that how we present ourselves openly on the outside is really who we are on the inside when the opposite is true. That was the tactic of the Yetzirah. That was the mistake of the people during Bait Shani, and that was the downfall of Sinat Chinam. That's why baseless hatred is equal to all three cardinal sins, because Sinat Chinam is the trait of the Chazir, of the pig, where on the outside you play that game that you love your neighbor, you love your friend, you love your family member, you care for him, you're close to him. You may even do a chazer or two with him. You smile in his direction. But on the inside, you harbor resentment. You harbor hatred. You hide your true emotions because you don't want anyone to know how you truly feel about that person. So you hide the truth. You hide it from your neighbors. You hide it from your friends. You even hide the truth from your own family members. Meaning what you display on the outside, the words that come forth from your mouth are the opposite of how you really feel and think inside of you. Therefore, the tikkun, the rectification of this generation is to fix that terrible trait of the chazir and bring the exile of the pig to an end. To be the kind of people that who we are on the outside is who we are on the inside. That what we present ourselves to be on the outside should be who we really are on the inside. And that we shouldn't use righteousness for any evil deed. That's the tikkun of our generation. To be as good on the inside as we are on the outside. That's why it's so important to have ladies the proper hadracha, to have the proper counsel, to have constant spiritual guidance on a consistent basis. Because there are times where we think that we're doing things that are necessary and even good, and we ask the wrong people for advice. And as a result, we end up doing things that create destruction in our lives and in the lives of other people. Sometimes we do things that we think is a mitzvah. And only somebody with foresight and with true Yerat Shamayim can tell us, no, 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 what you're doing is not a mitzvah. What you're doing is an act of the chazir. On the surface, our decisions and our actions seem like the best possible actions. But on the inside, it might be the worst thing we could do in the eyes of Hashem. And that's one of the reasons we're still entangled in this horrific galut. We're a generation that on the outside, we're holding the most beautiful siyamashas for all the Torah learning that we've done. And that's beautiful. But don't you realize that we're still suffering in this galut for 2,000 years? Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? You know why that is? Because on the inside, we're still lacking that one siman of kashrut that will turn us into the most genuine and complete kosher Torah Jews. And that's what we should work on in the coming days and in the coming weeks. We should work on being authentic Jews inside and out. We should work on true love for one another. We should eradicate the hatred and come together as one, as a united front, in order to abolish the galut of the chazir. Yiratzon, that our efforts to not only learn Torah, but to actuate it, should bring with it a kapara, a mechila from shamayim, and a redemption that's been long awaited and needed. May the tzaddik, the revered Rav, whose last words to us was to create a love and peace between one another. May the schut of Rav Shemariahu Yosef Chaim Kanievsky, Allah Shalom, Zecher Tzaddik Vekadosh Livracha, 
rise up, may his chut rise up to God's throne of glory and beseech him to send the geula to redeem us now. Amen ken, Yehiratzon. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for logging on to this Zoom class. Hashem yishmor otchem ve'yivarech otchem ve'yimalet kol mishalot libchem letova u'livracha. Let's make this tikkun so that the Chodesh of Nisan, which is full of Nisim, should bring it with it the nest of the final, final redemption. We'll see each other next week. Be'ezat Hashem. Thank you.